there's some used vehicles, once they run out of warranty, you couldn't pay me enough to take one on. For example, a vehicle like that. Unfortunately, there's lots of used vehicles that you definitely don't want to own because they'll take you to a place of financial ruin. While there's vehicles like Toyota, Lexus, Mazda now even represent some of the most reliable vehicles and lowest cost of running, they represent safe purchases, but not every vehicle is. And I just have to share with all of you guys because when all the journalists and motoring people and magazines and papers tell you about how great these new vehicles are, you never see or hear from them again once the warranty's expired. That's why I'm gonna share a list of 10 of the worst vehicles to own outside of warranty on the used car market. Let's get into it now. The first vehicle on the list that you seriously should avoid outside of warranty, sure, people buy them new, yeah, because they look stylish. They come in a variety of different colors, technology, they have a decently powered three and a half liter V6 that makes about 260 horsepower. Some downsides, of course, they have that rubber band transmission called the CVT, continuously variable transmission, but there are a host of issues with this vehicle that you literally don't want to even consider buying one. But let's take a quick look and understand what some of those problem areas are. I mean, sure, they have this really Really horrific looking front grille. Kind of looks like a fish scale right there. Basic looking headlights. Yeah, they look fairly sporty though as an overall profile. Yeah, they have little accents down there and some beautiful gunmetal wheels. Of course, fold away mirrors with a little light strip. And of course, lots of glass sunroof on top, which that's a, one of the problem areas. Of course, yeah, they also have this great little running extension back there of trim, almost looks like the Lexus RX. And they have a very big bulging hood, of course, with those two big shoulders right there. Lots of plastic to keep the rocks off the body panels. Yeah, some other extra great contours and designs. And there's no doubt about it, Nissan has created a very unique looking vehicle that stands out above the crowd. Of course, yeah, great looking tail lights and this is the SL model all wheel drive of course and it's the Murano by Nissan but unfortunately there's a lot of problems with these vehicles which is why I can't recommend this outside of warranty number one of course you have this big glass sunroof on top and that has been a real topic of discussion with a lot of these Nissans where a lot of those sunroofs they crack they split and they blow out and you don't even have a hint that it's coming sometimes people are driving along and boom and it just blows up Sadly, it's a very dangerous thing and you're sitting on pins and needles anxious for that moment that it might actually let go. But there's other issues. The sun visors just flop down inadvertently. Then we talk about the gas situation, the actuator for the door release. That sometimes faults out, doesn't work. The EVAP system clogs up and as well you can get excess fuel spills just because it does and it burps back and you wind up with fuel pouring down the side of the vehicle. Then of course down in there as you can see the steering wheel airbag problems is one of the big areas. Lots of issues with that. Down back here of course it's a very stylish looking rear deck lid or trunk lid but this has had lots of comments and people consumers complaining that does isn't latch it doesn't hold down or it's, it pops up inadvertently so there's an area there of course we also can't forget about the transmission it is CVT so that you will have the associated issues with that and the elevated maintenance aspect the engine lots of issues motor mounts where you get banging and clunking because every time you hit the throttle it clunk 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 and you get a banging noise because of bad motor mounts as well as unfortunately you get that rattling noise chain rattle <laughs> Yes, the death rattle. That's what you talk about when you say the timing chain starts getting loose, it could slip a cog and result in very expensive or catastrophic engine damage. If you're hearing that rattling noise, almost like a metal chain pulled through a metal garbage can or a bunch of nuts and bolts in a metal garbage can, that sound of rattling and banging and clinging, that's likely going to be an issue. And that has been an issue for many of these vehicles. So transmission, engine, auxiliary issues, electrics i mean you name it where do you begin where do you end it's just not worth the hassle this vehicle is just too catastrophic and quite frankly i would suggest going with something from toyota or even a car like this we're talking about the mazda cx9 you'll have much better success with the mazda number two is this hot little hot rod right behind me here and while it's not necessarily the most unreliable car it's more related to the frequency of small nickel and dime repairs the high probability of nickel and dime repairs and the fact of the matter is there's not a lot of these built so what you're going to find yourself getting them serviced properly and things break that really shouldn't be breaking but that is kind of the key here now this is an enthusiast car they're fun especially in this particular format we're looking at the fiat 500 specifically this is the abarth model and it's the 595 as we see right there 
Yes, they're small, spunky, very Euro flavored, and they're quick little hot rods. They're fun to look at. A lot of people certainly love them for the way they look, the compactness, the feel. They're a real driving dynamic kind of vehicle. Yeah, they have the little bug eyes there, and look at all sort of little interesting finish on the front. Again, it's the uh, Barth edition, but of course they have this really stout looking front nose on there. Big red calipers, gorgeous wheels. And of course, you got the hot little rocker panels there, little chrome handles, and of course, look, detail there. Set of dual quad tips back there, and of course, more detail, and very cool little tail lights, I might add. Look, this one has that beautiful little soft top up here with a gorgeous little wing. So it's a very cool, stylish, performance little subcompact vehicle. Beautiful in a lot of aspects. But personally, I'd say, unless you're a really hardcore, diehard enthusiast, and you really need to have this, don't be one of these people that's sort of wavering, hey, that looks kind of cute, I wonder what they're all about, and then decide and lay your money down on a Fiat 500. There's a lot of nickel and dime issues, for example. A lot of people complaining front suspension issues, clunking, banging, ball joints seem to be susceptible to wear and tear, and a lot of that probably has to do with people driving these, tend to drive them on two wheels, like to rip around the corners like they're going out of style, and of course then you hit bumps and that sort of aggravates some of the wear and tear that you're going to see in a lot of these cars, and sadly that is a thing. So a lot of structural support is going to take a hit. Suspension issues, brakes is another issue. You're gonna find problems with some of the brakes, not as much on the Abarth version, but certainly on some of the base 500 Fiat's. Not the greatest brakes and or suspension setup. So structurally, they're quite weak there. As well, there's some comments where people doing 65 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, boo, you get the power, power down. And they look back out of the tailpipe, and they see this white smoke billowing out there, and usually that generally means that engine's gone, toast. So while there's not tons of storage of that that is something that some people have known the clutch has been a very common issue for a lot of these vehicles the pressure plate is a problem area and of course to do any kind of clutch job even on a cheap car like this is still gonna cost you a two three four thousand dollars to get that rectified so you're dealing with a lot of parts and pieces that often just don't wear all that well it's not a grossly unreliable vehicle but there's areas that just shouldn't fail that do now there's also people talking about issues related to the steering yes the steering has been known to have issues electrical wiring in the base of it as well is a big big problem a lot of the interior also seems to have structural integrity issues issues some of which is the clock just seems to run fast no particular reason but that happens key gets stuck in the ignition that's another issue and of course a lot of people comment about the seats not necessarily reclining or being a faulty there door locks clearly is another issue right there with some of these vehicles getting in getting out locking it that's another problem and then unfortunately with some of these cars after an oil change customers are finding the check engine light or oil light coming on for some strange reason and that's because this multi-air setup here and they use a very specific type of oil and if you use something different like the old phrase puck around and pined out right so that's a problem and you definitely have to be sensitive to what's going on and what the oil is going into your engine and repair pal actually ranks these vehicles the fiat 500s at about three and a half out of five star which actually is a little better than most euro vehicles and jd powers ranks about 70 out of 100 so clearly not that notoriously unreliable it's just when they fail they break kind of big and the worst part is you have putting so much money into a dead equity. So in other words, a $100 saddle on a $10 horse, that theme applies. But generally, fun cars for the enthusiast, but not so much for the general population. I mean, clearly competition for these are vehicles like the Mercedes or the Mini Smart Car, as well as we talk about the other cars from BMW or the Minis. Those are all in the same space. If I can extend out and offer up something maybe a little more robust, maybe go with something a little bit more interesting and mainstream, say a Mazda MX-5 or the old Miata, those are reliable. If you want a fun, small, sporty car that's good on fuel and cheap, that's your bet. And the next vehicle on the list is this little beauty right here in wrapped in gray. I love the color. Yes, it's Euro. You You'd think it'd be built and built to last das auto the old volkswagen special what we're having right here what do you think well there's some problems and i want to explain why these are one of those vehicles you probably want to steer away from on the used car market once warranty runs out because the first year of these were made in 2018 that now puts the oldest version at the five-year mark so they're really literally starting to run out of warranty I mean, yes we're looking at the volkswagen and yeah they have the great led headlights look very similar to a lot of audi products gorgeous intake vents there and the front looks pretty stylish too i might add the overall vehicle looks quite attractive very modern but square and boxy not unlike modern volkswagens in this 
Taos right there as we see. Of course you have the beautiful fold away mirrors and the little one touch handles to get in. Can't forget the little roof racks on top and those gorgeous little LED tail lights. Look, fake exhaust. So in other words, yes, all wheel drive system on this beautiful little vehicle. It's quite attractive, utilitarian, versatile, well wearing, and I would expect it to be quite robust in terms of fit and finish and materials are gonna hold up quite well with years. Now, unfortunately, I know somebody put an order on one and they had to wait because they got it. They took it in and then of course they had to go right back to the dealer because of some issions. One of the issues was a leaky fuel system, wafting fuel. Well, what do you think if you're exposing open fuel fumes within the engine compartment where there's all these electrics and ignition parts. Yeah, that's a recipe for big disaster. Unfortunately, there's lots of cases too where people are saying the vehicle, when it's heavily loaded, for example, the air conditioner's on and you're driving in the heat, it's hot and sunny outside and you're driving along and you pull up to a stop sign and then all of a sudden the car <coughs> stalls and dies. Now there's been stories with that with of course the ECU needing a retweak or reprogram, but at the end of the day, why are vehicles hitting the street that die and stall when you just pull up to a set of lights. I mean, that's what I would expect from a 1974 Fiat or a 1981 Chevy Chevette. I wouldn't expect that from a modern day top level fuel injected Euro vehicle. No, I wouldn't. But there's clearly signs that there's some quality control issues here. After five years, I wouldn't personally want to risk holding on to one of these for any significant length of time. And number fourth on the list of ones that you definitely want to avoid outside of warranty is what we have parked right in front of me here. Now, this isn't taking a run directly at the brand because I believe the brand and has some much better, more improved drivetrains in recent years. Although this is one that will literally cost you 10 arms and three and a half legs when you look at it. And we'll get to that. Kidney style grills. And yeah, BMW is known for their big, stout looking front end. They also look very attractive. They flare out. This is a good looking vehicle on all counts. And I've owned an older version of this. This is an X5 35D. So I can definitely speak to some of the issues you can see here. Yes, they got big brakes. They're gonna be very expensive once they start wearing out. Tires, very big. And remember, this is an all wheel drive and BMW will not allow you to plug a nail in the tire. If you get a nail in the tire, they're not gonna patch it, they'll replace. If you have less than 70% wear left on those tires, they're gonna tell you, because of one little nail, they're gonna say you need to do four tires, run flats, that's a $3,000, $4,000 bill. Depends on the country you're coming from. Very expensive. Yes, the engine itself fundamentally is very stout, but there's so many other issues going on here. This one here, look at all the marks. This one's road hard, put away wet. Look at all the scuffs and dings and dents. There's rust on there as well. This car was used and abused like a rented mule. But everybody that I've seen in recent years who drives a BMW feels like they're Michael Schumacher, trying to put the car around every corner on two wheels. And that's why these cars sustain such serious repairs and cost the maintenance on the used car market. Yes, you have that big gorgeous roof rack to haul that dead moose out of the bush after you've gone hunting. And look, yes, look at these mirrors on here. What's going on there? Somebody's hit a bullard there. Now I will say the interiors hold up very, very well, but even this one looks well used and abused. Circle around, we got LED tail lights, big bold exhaust tips on both ends here, gorgeous sight lines here, you got extra vents, and you get just a lot of problems. Well, let me give you some examples. Many of these BMW X5s, especially the Ds, often have the third row. With the third row, they often outfit and upgrade and give you the air self-leveling suspension. So in other words, there's an air compressor, there's an actuator, it's this level height sensor, and of course, there's a set of airbags on the back end that keep the vehicle elevated. So even if you've got a lot of weight in the back or you're towing something, it keeps that vehicle level. The problem is those airbags, they don't last that long. You might get three or four years out of them. Certainly they'll last just beyond the warranty period and then they'll need replacing. The dealer's gonna charge you probably $2,000, $2,500 to do a set of airbags. Sure, you can do them yourself if you're a good DIYer at home. You could do them for probably five, six, seven hundred dollars round trip. But then there's also the air compressor. There's relays, there's other parts that can fail on that system. We also can't forget, I personally can speak from experience, diesel injectors, these piezo injectors that they use in these are actually very expensive. I had one injector, one out of all six, go on my 35D and the dealer charged me over $2,500 to replace that one injector parts and labor. Ouch. So then you have the EGR system, exhaust gas recirculation, that gets carboned up. It's a diesel engine, gets very, very plugged off, reduces performance and fuel economy. That's going to be an issue. Some people blank those off and do a bypass on them. They also have the DPF, the diesel particulate filter, down underneath, very expensive to replace. You're about $7,000 part if they plug 
rug off. A lot of semi-truck drivers actually remove them, clean them out. There's systems and processes to do that, but not so much on these vehicles. You're about six or seven grand to do that. Then of course, because it's a modern diesel, diesel exhaust fluid, so the DEF tank. Actually right down here, there's an active tank right here. There's also a passive tank at the back over there, but the active tank here has a heater in it. That heater burns out. It's a very prominent, very consistent issue that you will find. I had my X5 diesel for several years, and we actually went through two tanks. All BMW did was potentially extend it out to 10 years and 200,000 kilometers, which captured my first replacement. But my second one after that, I was toast after two more years and I had to put another one in there on my dime, several thousand dollars. Very expensive parts on these. And once you exceed warranty on the diesel, you're toast. Unless you want to do a full delete, remove all that hardware and then bypass emissions, which technically in some places it's illegal. Unless you do that and go through that process, which does cost you a lot of money anyway and a lot of DIY time, you're literally stuck with a drowning pig of despair. And the fifth one is another vehicle that I would suggest staying away from. Now, I personally love a lot of the modern day Jaguars. There's a lot of great models and Jaguar has gone a long way since Tata Motors. They're much improved, better, more reliable, better drivetrains and literally you can drive a lot of them daily because they're just that much better built. But back in the day, what we have here are a couple of Jags. And I wanna ask you the simple question. I don't know what they were thinking with this blue one. Were they trying to copy this one? What we have here is a higher end Jaguar. This was the XJ. And over here we have the X-Type. And while no one's gonna say a mo an older Jaguar is gonna be reliable, the reality is the X-Type is a mess. Why is that? Well, unfortunately, yes, they look and share a lot of the same design themes and elements. They look very much like the XJ beside it. Of course, you have very similar type headlights. Look at that type of headlight. It looks very, very similar. Of course, similar style of grill, and you really almost get confused looking at them straight on. Even the hood design, you have that piece up the middle with the little kitty cat on the front. Same thing here. You have the kitty cat on the front with the piece up the middle. It looks very, very similar. So you start to think, well, I can get that look for way less money and get myself an X-Type. Well, that would be a trouble. Sure, you have some beautiful detail like the chrome. Of course, nice wheels on there. And look, simple little mirrors. Of course, what is that starting to look like? Does that look like a Ford Contour? Perhaps Ford Mondeo? Yeah, a little bit. And there's a reason for that. But yes, you also do get that little sunroof on top and all of the other luxury amenities you would expect from a modern day Jaguar. Like we see right here, this is a two and a half. Of course, X-Type, as I mentioned. Looking down here, we do have a set of dual exhaust tips, almost like we do over there on the XJ. But this vehicle is not all that well made. It's really there more to represent the price point for Jaguar when they were at that point. They were trying to transition, Ford took over possession of the brand, and this is what you get. You get rubber seals like that popping out all over the place. You have interiors that feel much like a 15 year old Ford product. Parts like the door handles stolen from a lot of their lower end cars, including the door panels, I might add, and even worse, the engine. Yes, there was lots of notifications. People had issues with transmissions. Ford's always had transmission issues, but the big issue was the engine. That little four banger had huge amounts of issues. The main one being overheating, valve cover gaskets, and internally cooking its engine. It just wasn't well built and it didn't hold up very well. I mean, a lot of people complaining about transmission issues, specifically hard shifts. It would slip, not make at all. You'd have to rev it up and then it might go. Of course, you also had oil pan gasket leaks down there. That was a common issue. You could actually come out and you typically find oil all over, pissing all over the ground. Coolant leak, obviously just a persistent loss, just dribbles of coolant and green stuff all over the ground randomly at regular occurrences. And even the radiator was known to split and crack and leak. That was a hot point. And that break where you transitioned from hoses to the system, it was just, it seemed like a weak link in the whole program. And as I mentioned, cooling systems, bad engines, transmissions were the name of the game. We also can't forget about the general poor build quality that Ford delivered. You even have a little bit of rust starting to develop in some of these areas. And this is not uncommon. And this is even a vehicle that's primarily garage cleaned and never sees the light of day in winter time. So my suggestion, if you really need to have that piece of British motoring, maybe skip the X-Type altogether and go with a modern day XE like this. Although this one's obviously run hard, put away wet as well. These will likely hold up a little better than some of the older XEs. So far, there are some QC issues with these models, but not nearly to the same degree that you're finding in the X-Type. So number six has to do with this vehicle that's parked right behind us here. And it's not just this vehicle, it's really any modern day BMW in the range of 2011 to 2000, about 17, that shares similar drivetrains as this particular car. And we'll get to that and we'll tell you some of the reasons and 
and some of the problem areas, but let's look at this. Yeah, you wanted a cheap entry-level BMW. A lot of people thought, hey, that looks like a great idea, right? Wrong. I mean, you probably got attracted because you have those angel eye headlights. They were LEDs. Of course, you did have that stout looking front nose on there. BMW and their great wheels that they always splatter on their vehicles. Of course, you have the kidney grills right here and that gorgeous little windmill. High gloss, LED strip. These handles are at least a robust. There's one thing I can say, and the sunroofs rarely fail on these cars. But look back here, we have these LED tail lights. And this one's X-Drive, that means it's all-wheel drive, and it's the 328 right here. Of course, we do have a set of tailpipes there. Looks quite dirty and nasty. Look how carbon and crusty that looks. And people like these, though. They seem to grab a lot of attention. People gravitate to them. They're a popular sales piece for BMW. And even the interior is well-wearing. Seat bolsters hold up very, very well. The latest iDrive system works well. And generally, the interiors are ergonomically correct. But the unfortunate part, you'll notice this is a 328. And a lot of vehicles that use the 328 or a lot of variations of that, it uses an N20. It's a turbo four-cylinder engine. It's two-liter displacement. And it had some serious heartburn for a long time. Now the current B48, which replaced this, is a much better, more reliable, more robust engine that doesn't leak as bad, cools better, and it just seems to be more reliable. But this generation, in the early years, from 2011 to about 2013, 14, is where you really felt the burn. In any models with the 28 series or 30 series engines, that's where you're definitely gonna feel it. Some of the classic problem areas that you're gonna see, because once you're outside of warranties, when they always seem to kind of come smacking down and teach you a lesson in manners. The N20 had lots of issues, vano solenoids, Clearly those were a failure point. Vanos is a variable valve timing. If they're not working right, you get a sluggish performance at the bottom, sluggish performance at the top, or they don't idle right. You can definitely get drivability issues with Vanos problems. Valve cover gasket leaks. That's very problematic, very typical. Coolant leaks. They have those snap together plastic fittings. They're clearly not a, a well-built area and an area that you're definitely gonna start pouring money into left, right, and center. Of course, you have issues with water pumps and thermostats. They're gonna leak coolant or they're gonna wanna leak coolant. So you're gonna have to constantly be on top of those types of repairs. And just go look at ECS or some of the other aftermarket places that sell you full hose reseal sets. I mean, you could spend $15,000, $2,000 just for the materials and then try to get into that engine and reseal it. But that's not where it all ends. There's other problems. You get the infamous seal leaks as well at the oil filter housing because it has the oil cooler goes to the housing and the housing mounts to the engine. There's two sets of convoluted O-rings or gaskets and they leak on both ends. You can leak coolant, oil, or just mix. It's just a bad scene. Also, the infamous timing chain rattle noise that you're gonna get on some of the earlier generations. There are some poor ramps design and the whole timing system wasn't built all that well or what to hold up. So essentially you could start getting that rattly noise, that chain noise, almost like I explained earlier with the Nissan, you can get that rattly clinky, clink, 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 or even on a shutoff or it's when it's idling. And if it's starting to rattle, that means your chain's getting loose. If the chain's loose, it's probably because the tensioners aren't working or the guides and the ramps are made of a crappy plastic and they fail. And then what you have is a situation where it could jump a cog. If it jumps a cog, you have pistons and valves crashing together, making a love child of a $5,000 engine repair or a $15,000 engine replacement. It's just a bad scene, not a great engine. And while if you didn't have some of those key area issues for the first five years, you found yourself in a relatively reliable BMW. But unfortunately, outside of warranty, put some miles on, some of those key areas are guaranteed to kick you in the rump. So if I could make a suggestion as an alternative, either go with a newer car, possibly 2018 and newer with the B48 if you need a BMW, or even just go with something a little simpler and more reliable like, like this, a Lexus 350. Right here, we have a little cabriolet or convertible. Go with the sedan or the coupe, whatever. But either way, this is a much more reliable vehicle and a similar classification, and you're gonna have far fewer issues, and this car will literally last 300,000 plus miles. And the next car is this little hot rod in white. What do we actually have here? Well, every manufacturer has their little price point car, and I would say for GM or Chevy in this case, this is what that is. But let's take a look around. Yes, we do have a Chevy, and yeah, they have that sleek front end. Almost like Dodge has the 200, these guys have this. Yeah, they have great little wheels on there, little alloys, beautiful little mirrors. They almost look like a Honda Civic mirror. Of course, you got this beautiful chrome touch with one touch access, no sunroof on top, but more single touch to get inside the back. Look around here. Look at these big, bulky, bulbous looking taillights. This is a Cruze by Chevy, and it's the Premier Edition. 
Pretty average looking, nothing too much to write home about, but it's what you would expect for in an entry level car. A cheap entry level price point cars are great when they're cheap and they don't break. But think about it this way. Yes, you get a cheap car that keeps going and going and going, that's fine. But how about a cheap car that something major goes, a transmission, an engine? That's when you basically throw the car out. And so after warranty, you would almost guarantee to see a problem here. There's too many problems consistent with this particular model. Let's get into a few of those things and then I'll explain basically that's why these vehicles are not worth buying outside of warranty because you'll likely wind up tossing this vehicle out. It's literally a game of Russian roulette because a few issues are. Coolant issues. Some people are complaining about smoke wafting out from under the hood or even possibly into the cabin. It could be a heater core or possibly just a smell of antifreeze inside the vehicle. Ugly. How about transmission? Of course, we know that transmissions are one of the big most expensive part in any vehicle. And unfortunately, there's way too many people complaining about these vehicles slipping, hesitating, jerking, sudden shifting, not engaging at all. And usually that just means a full on replacement. A new transmission for a car like this might actually cost you, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars to replace all in parts and labor, especially if you're from my parts of the country where we get ripped off at the dealer network. And then of course, another big issue that I can't help but saying is electric problems. Some people go in there, try to start it up and it won't start and electrical gremlins all over. We rented one of these in Las Vegas a few years ago too and I opened the door and you could actually see the door drop as well about you know quarter three eighths of an inch. So clearly even body integrity, structure, not all that great in these vehicles. They're not built all that well. Not only that, we have to talk about the obvious engines. Engines are where you can literally write a vehicle off. If an engine blows up in this, you might as well call that five to $8,000 to replace, then it's like, what's the point? Because the vehicle itself won't be worth that after five years of age, it won't have that kind of value tied into it. So you might as well take this car straight to the scrapyard. And the problem is common issues hold pistons. In other words, people complain about some of the engines spewing out oil or all of a sudden check engine light, knock, 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 or hearing weird noises. Usually that means with these particular cars, there's been lots of people complaining about a hole in the piston. In other words, you have no more compression, deterioration, and of course an engine that just basically is throwaway because you pop a hole in the piston, that's your compression. Without it, the engine scrap. And that's unfortunately a common issue with some of these Chevy Cruises. But instead of buying a Chevy Cruise, maybe buy one of these brand new Acura Integras. This is based on the Honda Civic. It's guaranteed to run a long, long time. It's not that expensive. It's quite affordably priced and guaranteed to outlast anything from GM. Here's the next wreck that's on my list that I wouldn't recommend to anybody outside of warranty. There's way too many problems with these vehicles. And what are we looking at here? Yeah, they've got a great all-wheel drive system. I'll give them that. But there's a lot of problems that I wouldn't touch without having some sort of a warranty in place. Sure, it's practical. People think they're great. Why? You've got hatchback you got lots of room for all your people and friends and dogs and luggage back here. You're dealing with an Impreza and it's a Subaru product, of course. Yeah, it's somewhat attractive, sporty, practical. Yeah, you've got little goofy handles and of course lots of great details, but it's a simple little vehicle. Yeah, you've got these little flares here and alloy wheels and look at these headlights around here on this Subaru. Great little vehicle from a practicality standpoint, but not a great vehicle from a reliability standpoint. Number one, CVT transmission, that's a continuously variable rubber band transmission that Subaru will just not give up on. Now why is that? Well, they're lighter, they're cheaper, and as well, the best thing is they keep RPMs down for a longer period, which in other words means that you're going to get better fuel economy. So it's all about bragging rights and all about getting the numbers down there for the environmentalists and as well to satisfy government officials and all these other yo-yos that want to have a vehicle to say that we're doing our part to get the best possible fuel economy. So what are the kind of other areas as to why I would not actually recommend one of these vehicles outside of warranty. Well, let's take a look. Well, you can expect oxygen sensor issues. How about spark plug wires, check engine lights because of knock sensors? How about the cooling system problems and the leaks that you would anticipate from this vehicle? And we also can't forget about EGR valves. We also can't forget about engines, oil consumption, and just essentially motors that don't last. Let me just say that anybody who I know who owned a Subaru Impreza had some sort of an engine swap done at some point. Virtually every one of these is good for short amount of miles. The engines just don't last. They're flat four. They're just not that well built and you can guarantee to have to put an engine in one if you plan to hold on to one for much longer outside of warranty. I've known people with a Forester. I've known people with WRX STIs, standard WRX as well as basic Impreza's and almost every one of them had serious engine problems somewhere along the way. So clearly bad transmissions, engines, electrics, coolant leaks, O2 sensors and the like. Junk, 
can't recommend. Maybe instead of one of these vehicles, get yourself even an Audi A4. If you can believe it, I would have over this vehicle or even better for reliability, go with a Toyota Camry or even a Corolla. The next big failure is one that you probably don't want to have either. It's specifically the 2011 to 2015 is where you really hit the sweet spot. And that's a little car right behind me here. What is this? Well, we know it's a Kia. We can tell right there. Look at the grill. Great. Yeah, you got rock art, protect the paint, but unfortunately there's other bigger issues. Yeah, you've got the great mirrors there and the little accent. Obviously nice little chrome detail on there. Look, you even get a little wing on there. And this is the Optima by Kia EX GDI specifically. Of course, clearly look at all that garbage on the tailpipes. It's clearly an issue with a little extra carbon fouling, but there's a bigger issue than just a little carbon fouling. Yes, you got great alloy wheels, cool little detail. I'm not gonna lie, that windshield looks pretty interesting up top there and does that large glass all the way along the back. So there are parts of this car that look very interesting with that spoiler on the back and just the overall shape does, does look very contemporary. But there's a couple big issues, some of which are the electrics, some of which are transmission related and a lot of customers are complaining in 2011 that transmission shifting issues. Now some people said it was tunable and repairable with a little flash at the dealer but not everyone fixed that way and even more importantly the big issue are the engine catastrophic failures that you're seeing in a lot of customers sad state of affairs with a lot of that generation the engines that you'll find in a lot of these vehicles were known to just catastrophically go boom and a lot of it just related to rod knocks you'd start hearing the knocking banging you'd start getting maybe a little smoke check engine light the next thing you know your engine locks up and it won't restart sometimes you're actually burning roadside even unfortunately hear the siren Yes, they're coming already because there's a Kia burning right now. That's one of the problem areas with some of these Kia Optimas. Sadly, unfortunately, there are some significant problems. I wouldn't want to touch one. Transmission, engine, electrics, what's left? Not much. Maybe buy yourself a Honda Accord instead. Next car literally you don't want to buy anytime soon is the early generation Tesla Model S like we look at right in front of us. Yeah, they look great. They're the pioneer of electric. Yeah, indeed they are. And I know there's some other car brands out there that say that they are the pioneer, but Tesla's brought it to the mainstream, of course, with the Roadster, then the Model S. We have all kinds of different options. Yes, they're cool. They're, mid, they're groundbreaking, but they're also wallet breaking and what kind of problems would you anticipate with this model s well first of all look they do have some cool headlights and i do love that style of grill but you can tell right there that's the older style model s because of that front style grill the new ones look quite different you do have these great pitch fork style grills there alloy wheels that look very intense of course here now the newer versions have a camera in there but look at the nice little chrome touches I love those mirrors and the way they swing back. Look at those door handles, one issue. These door handles don't always open close all the way. That's a problem. Of course, we have lots of glass on top. There's lots of expensive maintenance with that if that fails. Go around the back, you have beautiful LEDs. Trademark for Tesla, of course, here we have lots of chrome bits and detail looks great. But water in the lights, that's one of the issues. Of course, fit and finish. You have panel gaps that aren't the same all the way along. Look at the door handles. This one's recessed more than the other side. Problem areas there. Alignment issues, more issues there. The paint hasn't always been known to be the best and doesn't hold up the best either. And the interiors are quite unique, but not necessarily the best quality either. But yes, sadly, there's a lot of problems you'd find with these. You've seen guys on the internet talk about batteries getting faulted because of AC systems leaking water down onto the battery, shorting everything out. That's a problem. Power steering problems, alignment issues because of the sheer weight of the vehicle bearing down on that system. Electrics, doors, the centralized panel system that controls everything has been known to fault out a lot of these vehicles. Door handles, like you name it, where does it begin and end? Driver's side seat belt not working properly. How about the parking brake on the rear? That's another issue that has been known to creep up from many time to time. As well as loss of power steering and it just gets really Joe Armstrong there to manipulate it. Bad windshield wipers not functioning properly or the mirrors not necessarily coming out all the way. Lots of electrics because these cars are primarily a rolling computer and there's a lot of potential for a lot of issues and a lot of the problems have crept in. Because remember with time things get better but the earlier generations did see a lot of teething issues. The other thing to consider this is a 2015. If you go back to 2013 models, you gotta think, now you're at that 10 years of age. Well, Tesla only warranties them for so long. You know these batteries are only good for about 10 or 12 years, and then you gotta spend about 20 to $30,000 to replace your batteries. How do you like to buy that car and then it only gets you another couple of years and then you gotta spend that big bill? Not really a great deal, so that's why you probably don't wanna buy one of these used on the secondhand market. If you really need to have one, 
You can maybe step up to something a little newer, maybe the Model 3 definitely puts down decent performance, get in the performance version, or even step into a Porsche Taycan. And here's the next catastrophic swing and a miss. What are we looking at here? Clearly, it looks great, but it doesn't go so great. And there's a lot of reasons why this vehicle is not something you want to keep for a long time. In other words, that's why it's sitting on a car lot right now, because the previous owner just wanted to wash their hands of this junk and move on. What we're looking at is a 2017, that's right. So the warranty has expired a couple of years back and they probably realized that this car was just a mess. They didn't want anything to do with it and it's time to trade it in for something a little more reliable or responsible, like a Toyota, for example. Somebody somewhere along the way thought this was cute and decided, hey, I wanna buy it. There's clearly some endearing features to these vehicles. That's why people are buying this junk. Interesting headlights, they're very, very cool, I might say, from the front end. If you like SUVs, these are very cool. You have these dish style front hood detail on there. Of course, you have beautiful alloy wheels right there, as you notice. Decent enough brakes to actually haul this Hulk down from speed. Yes, great detail. Detail. Look at that. Of course, roof racks to haul that bed bug mattress to the dumpster. Here, right here, you have that little sleek back end. Look at the hips on this. Yeah, it definitely looks a little sporty from there. And we're dealing with a Santa Fe by Hyundai. And of course, this is the sport version 2.0T. Ouch. And it's the all wheel drive. Look carbon at the chute right there that means there's a lot of crap coming out of the tailpipe of course go down the side yeah they have some great detail and a look rocker panels that are nicely accentuated and the interior looks quite slick and well put together but that's just part of the storyline everybody knows unfortunately hyundai and kia have gone through some real real problem areas in the last few years a lot of it had to do with the engines there's tons of recalls millions of vehicles that have been pulled off the street for repairs refurbishments engine changes there's all kinds of things but let's talk about some of the specific issues you're going to find with the santa fe sport right here the airbag deployment issue is one of the big problems with these vehicle gets in a collision and the airbag doesn't go Clearly that hit the NHTSA's radar. We also have other issues like peeling exterior paint. I mean, clearly right here you can see now there might've been some previous damage, but this is not an uncommon phenomenon to actually have some of the peeling paint effect go on here. You also have some of the peeling paint on the wheels and it's just not a vehicle that holds up all that well. You put a little mark on it and all of a sudden the peeling paint starts to run away on you and then next thing you have is a really, really ugly eyesore for a paint job. A lot of four cylinder engines tend to use a little more oil. They tend to work a little harder than their bigger brother, the V6s, the V8 counterparts where they're typically running at a lower RPM to make the power, they get the torque. The smaller engines usually now are turbocharged, higher revving, and as a result, they're often going to use a little bit more oil, consume the oil. RPMs are up, the oil's moving around, doing a harder job, heating up, and of course a breakdown happens. And that's when we find oil starting to degrade and then starts to burn out the tailpipe. And so these vehicles are known for high oil consumption, but not just because of that phenomenon of a four cylinder engine. These are exclusively high oil consumption. And even more problematic is related to the engine than just oil consumption. We're talking about engine failure. Yeah, another big problem is related to engine oil fragments, that's right metal particulate in the oil because that has been a big problem some of the recalls have been extended out this far some of the earlier engines from even a few years before this have been known for major catastrophic engine failures where the engine oil is contaminated with metal particulate that metal particulate came from a lot of times the machining process which drilled out some of the parts the crankshaft and some of the lower end parts the metal particulate ends up flowing through the oil and then winds up in places that prevent the oil from doing its job which is cooling the bottom of the engine and which of course naturally results in a rod knock because now we have the lower end of the engine the crankshaft main rod bearings are not getting all the cooling and lubrication that they need and then ultimately that just means they get overheated hot spots they start developing very early in excessive wear and then you start getting engines that may knock rattle bang and of course even worse there's lots of cases where they've started on fire yes indeed a lot of these vehicles have burned roadside because of some of the problematic engines that you find under the hood of these vehicles. Not only does it mean heavy oil consumption, not only does it mean engine knocking up front, it could actually mean that you lose the vehicle a total loss. And even worse to that, people have been found themselves financially put out by some of these vehicles and their lives and well-being being impacted by some of these vehicles. And there's other annoyances, even like engine hesitation when you go to accelerate. Nobody wants to have that scenario. You want to press the gas, you want to go. Well, that's 
potential another issue as well as turbo parts and pieces and maintenance is going to cost you in the long run so there's no way i would ever want to keep a vehicle with a known engine problem transmission issues and even more importantly oil consumption or drivability issues way beyond warranty time forget it there's way too many other good choices out there for example instead of this heap i'd go for something like a toyota 4runner a lexus rx350 or even a honda pilot like this much better safer more reliable and guaranteed to last and with all of that said check it out you're gonna love that some of the most reliable vehicles because of the engines that you'll find in them you'll love that video it's gonna help you a lot if you're on the hunt for a new vehicle hope to see each and every one of you on the next one we'll catch you real soon Bye bye